We got a couple more people coming in, uh, but uh, hope everybody had a good week, cooler week coming up. Have you noticed that? High of 79 tomorrow after 91 today. That's going to feel good all week. Come on in, Tracy. Good to have you here. Uh, and uh, see what else. Hi, Kelly. Uh, so, as you came in, my lovely admin said, make sure everybody has one of these because it's not going to be in your notes and it's an important part of our discussion this morning. So, if you don't have one, you may want to run out and get one. Uh, we, as normal, give out our packet of stuff, starting with your <laughs> assignment to uh, fill in. And again, I repeat, if you do that uh, every week and you get a score, it well, this actually has the midterm exam as well, <laughs> so surprise, <laughs> but you don't turn it into me. It is self-reporting, self-scoring, self-awareness, okay? And then if you add them all up for the six weeks, uh, you will get a score on your generosity uh, awareness, your generosity practice along the way. A couple more things. John Wesley on stewardship uh, was a great generous leader of the church uh, back in history. And this one, uh, coach turns down significant raise, the five pillars of true prosperity. It's a basketball coach story who uh, turns something down, a raise from his employer, which is certainly countercultural in our day. Now, the heavy theological reading for this week is this little book called Plastic Donuts. Don't report me to the elders. It's got Bible in it. Okay? But it's a great story of a guy named Jeff Anderson out in Tulsa, who is an executive pastor. He had a little three-year-old girl. He's trying to do whatever work at home on a Saturday or sometime. And his little three-year-old girl came in with a plastic uh, teacup from her tea party and said, Daddy, do you want a cup of tea with me? Well, what, good, what do good daddies do? Yeah. Well, of course, and he sips it, and mama, mama, and it tastes so good. Oh, do you want a donut to go with it? So she goes back to her place and brings that, and this uh, book springs off from that. But more, <laughs> hi guys, uh, more, uh, more important is the fact that he breaks the glass ceiling on giving principles and what biblical giving is all about. So I'm glad that you are here because you may not have heard what's in this book, but actually we're going to preview it, give you a, a look at it. It's on this sheet right here. It, it, I can guarantee you it'll be 99% new information along the way. So, Tracy... <laughs> Not to pick on you, but you asked a great question last week. It's bothered me all week long, in a good way. And we've talked about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. How do you figure out this covetous contentment thing? Uh, okay, so, before, this is extra. There's no extra charge for this, but it's not in your notes, okay? But you may want to write some of it down. So here's my thoughts, <laughs> Tracy, not to pick on you, but I thank you for it, because you're going to... I was trying to figure out the right word. You're going to make me reveal my bias, help me reveal my bias, <laughs> uh, but it's really not by it, my bias, it's God's bias, and it's good. So, uh, here is where my thinking went. All of us are given so much resources. Now, I'm not unaware that there's more to it than dollars. It is time, talent, and treasure, and I'll give you another acronym along the way. But with whatever we have, whatever God gives to us, there are only three things to do. Now, the last slide, I think last week was, uh, we can either give it, we can save it, or we can spend it. But I'm going to use some different words here. Uh, one, we can put it into consumables. What do I mean by that? Okay, you, uh, you use gas, you put gas in your car to get here today, right? Once you burn that gas, it's gone, okay? There is no recovery on that. And it, it has to do with the basics of life. Food, clothing, shelter, consumables. And there, this last column I want to call, what is the trend? The trend in this category is down. 
Have any of you uh, either seen the little slide of how much $1,000 will buy at the lumberyard today versus a year ago? Have you seen that going around? <laughs> okay, the trend is down. Houses are up, you know? Uh, whatever goes in here is a decreasing, because of inflation and other things, it is a decreasing trend. The second trend we could call uh, investments or future but it's our attempts to somehow put something in the way that doesn't, you know, it's gone as soon as we do it. Uh, to put something away for the future, and I use the phrase uh, from Dave Ramsey, <clears throat> live like no one else today so you can live like no one else tomorrow, right? And it's saying, I don't want us at all to go in this category, though that is the trend in our culture, okay? And to not only use it all, but then go on credit and go, you know, 110% or something. But there are these things here, uh, that are investments and it could be our retirement where, and these all kind of fit into category. It could be, you know, 401ks, uh, IRAs and so forth, put it, putting away. But it's what we don't spend up here is uh, it's delayed. And the, the point of this one is it's delayed gratification. That's what, when we choose to do that, go into our retirement program or live below our means so that we can... Uh, we can have something up there. Got in the wrong column here. But. Uh, and here is the trend on this one. <laughs> Everybody understands that, right? Price of houses, price of stocks, you know, price of uh, what we're getting on our returns in our, in our bank accounts, CDs, and so forth. In the last one, I will label kingdom. And... This is where, and we, it would go in the giving category on the three words that were at the end of last week, but kingdom uh, is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth because you're going to lose it. I heard of the couple who tried to impress their kids on all the stuff they wanted and all the toys, so they took them to the city dump. And there they found dolls with one arm. <laughs> they saw, you know, broken electronics. And they said, this is, just remember, everything goes to the dump that we have. <laughs> you know, it was a good lesson. Uh, but down here, Christ says in the last half of that verse, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven where moth doesn't, <laughs> Moth and rust don't corrupt, thieves don't break in and steal. In other words, it's lasting. And here is the trend on this. And it's when uh, Jesus explains it one day when uh, his disciples were whining. They said, you know, all this stuff, but look at us. What do we get for following you? We gave up our trade. We gave up, our, we gave up everything for you. Anybody remember what he said? Whatever you have given up, I will return to you 100-fold. Okay, here's the trend on this. Ten thousand percent return. We probably don't have that in our uh, best stock portfolio. So my bias, Tracy and others in here, God's bias is uh, invest with something that has a good trend line. Now. But I tried to get up here, and some of you were early. I was frustrated because I couldn't get a picture up on because I wanted the picture from God's pie of the guy with the pie, his one little piece, God sitting over here, right? And we talked about it. God's not shaking a finger at him for dividing it up that way. He's not mad. He's not going to take his piece of pie. He's just saying, hey, hey, it's an invitation. <laughs> it's an option. So everybody kind of get the... I know we came out of this on covetous to contentment. Okay, so we we have choices. <laughs> God is inviting. He's not making anybody do anything. Any one of us ever has made anybody do anything? Uh, but He says, "Take a look at your choices, and what is the better choice?" Everybody got that? Yes, sir. Yeah. One other. So we talked about this a lot. <laughs> I think everybody was thinking on it, and something you said last week was the world just kind of loves God's order. Yeah, yeah. So God's order is the way we say give, save, spend. 
So you're going to spend out of your surplus, but you get yep. first first fruits for the world flips it. And yep. Spend. And after you spend all you want, you save a little bit. And then, uh, if you have a little bit left to get, exactly. you do it. And so it's just going to flip the order. Yep. Which I'm into. Yep. That's why I use Romans 12, 2, our key verse. Do not conform to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is six weeks of helping us renew our minds. And I love, I listen to a podcast called Money Wise. I'll give you that. You can write it down, but I'll give it to you later when we talk about electronic <clears throat> budgeting, uh, Money Wise. But I love their phrase. It's something like this. The Bible is our uh, financial planner. Everybody got that? <laughs> you know, we like to think it's the guy or the woman, you know, that we uh, hired to do it. But the Bible is our financial planner. And it will be upside down, sir. I don't know. What's your first name? John. John. It will be upside down. And we may get laughed at. We go, why do you do that? You know, and I may, may give an illustration to this morning if I <laughs> remember that. It just came to my mind. Okay. We're going to pray. Uh, took more than five minutes, Tracy, but it, a lot of people are engaged with that. You know, great, great conversation. But it's choice. And one more phrase I'll put on. Jesus is going to go to the home of Martha and Mary. My mother's name was Martha. All of a sudden in the kitchen. So I don't have to remember which one was in the kitchen. It was like my mother. Okay. And uh, uh, Martha's in the kitchen. She comes out and whines. Hey, get Mary in here to help. And what did Jesus say about Mary. She has chosen the better. You got a choice. You know, you can be busy with this stuff, or you can sit at Jesus' feet and guess. And by the way, just to be a little open about it, during the whole COVID thing, because I'm an active person and I like to be here with classes and I like to be doing something, and I'm locked down at home and I'm not happy. Uh, and that was one of the things that God brought to me was uh, choose the better. You know, I can I can still be with God during that period of time. Uh, so it doesn't. Sorry. Okay, uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into the core of today. And again, thank you, Tracy, for the good question. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this class, their interest, their faithfulness. Uh, I just love the... Uh, the message that comes through that this church is filled with people who believe the word of God, who look to the word of God for guidance. We're thankful that we can uh, focus on this a niche uh, conversation over the six weeks of what we do with our possessions in order to hear one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Whatever you want to teach us today by your spirit, through your word from one another, uh, stimulating questions and uh, uh, dialogue and conversation. We uh, ask for your grace and understanding. Give us spiritual minds to pick up what you want us to uh, learn today. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, last slides last week were three things where our money go, goes. Giving, saving, and spending. And if you're a parent with young kids, you should be teaching that to them from the first money you give to them. And if you do it with three jars or three envelopes or three little piggy banks or whatever, begin teaching that right away. It will help in, the gener in your generations to come. Okay? It's very simple. But again, John, as you said, it's not the way the world does it. Because it's spend. Uh, I ought to save something. I'm going to retire someday. Uh, I don't have any little thing left over to give along the way. So uh, let's jump into the topic of... I can't read what the white says. Can you? Pursuing financial freedom. Pursuing financial freedom. freedom. Yeah. Uh, uh, giving and saving. We're going to spend a very little bit of time in saving. Uh, just kind of an emergency stuff because we're going to have less than five on retirement planning, which is the major saving thing we all, all ought to be doing. So we'll take that extra time there. So, John, you were right on. Rooted in the Old Testament, uh, bring, the, bring the best of the first fruits of your uh, soil to the house of the Lord your God. Uh, it's rooted in God's instructions to his people from the very beginning. You give first. You give first. Paul wrote about it in Corinthians. He said on the first day of the week. <clears throat> Remember the Jewish people, they went to temple, synagogue, whatever, on Saturday, the last day of the week, but it changed to the first day of the week. I'm sure you've heard this taught from uh, classes or from messages here. It was that to honor the resurrection of Christ. The day of worship changed. 
in the new covenant. We just talked about covenant, right? A couple of weeks ago, new covenant. Okay, it, it changed to the first day of the week. So Paul said, okay, when you go to church, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. That's, that's where you get proportionality. Okay, uh, you get regularity each week. You get proportionality like according to what God gives you. There is some ratio, and we'll give you a book next week that talks uh, more about that. Uh, saving it up so that when I come. The offering that Paul was uh, talking about was an offering to the saints in Judea, Jerusalem, because they were undergoing a famine. So he wrote this letter to Corinth, which is west of the Holy Land, and saying, uh, okay, start saving it up because I want to take it to the saints in Jerusalem. But it was on the first day of the week. Why then? Because it was a, a cash society. You either got paid daily or weekly. And uh, so you take it out of when you get it. The first thing, John, <laughs> nobody ever taught me tithing. I went to Christian Christian college. I went to Dallas Seminary. And I, I never got... Unless I slept through it. There was never a chapel service, which is a high possibility. Uh, but there was never a chapel service or certainly a unit in seminary for pastors going out on how to teach stewardship, how to teach generosity. Where is tithing? Where does that fit in the larger biblical message? It's been flyover territory for generations. That's why I'm excited to be able to teach it here at uh, Fellowship. Now, is this a legalistic rule? Uh, do you understand when you look in the Bible the difference between prescriptive and descriptive? Prescriptive is you should do this. Descriptive is this is what people did in this situation. For example, the widow's mite. She gave it all. You can teach that passage badly saying you ought to give it all. No, it was descriptive of that situation. The whole book of Acts is largely descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, so this is not descriptive the first day of the week because you say, I only get paid every other week. What do I do in that week? I, do I have to split it? No, this is not legalistic descriptive or prescriptive. It is just descriptive of their culture. If you work on commission, then you set aside when you get your commission. Everybody follow me on that? The weekly thing is not prescriptive. It is descriptive along the way. Okay, uh, we looked at this first last week, but again, uh, it plays in here. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Back to John in the back row. There better be something left after you do your, your spending and your saving. It's, it's basic. It's rudimentary to God's plan for uh, to bless us in our giving. This is a longer passage, and again, we could take the whole hour on it, but just follow this along. Remember this. Uh, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Wow, oh, then it really gets small. Okay. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. That's freedom, choice. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, that's the attitude in giving. Not obligation, not grumpingly, um, grudgingly. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is said. Remember what I said? Anytime God talks about giving, he always talks about the poor. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. And then this one is our promise verse. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of righteousness. Now, did I not last week put a thing up on the board? Maybe I didn't. About uh, I taught I taught this class sort of on Wednesday, so uh, so I'm a little confused here. Uh, but a lot of people will say this is where you get into health, wealth, and prosperity teaching. But uh, the last sentence takes that away. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Again, there's a lot in there. But let me just put up here, uh, when we ask God if we are in a health, wealth, prosperity mentality, we are asking God so we can consume it. I want to go on another trip. I want to uh, impress the neighbors with a 
you know, how God blessed me and I have a new car. If we ask from a biblical standpoint, uh, and we, uh, we give it so that we may be generous upon every occasion. There's a huge difference, but people can get that confused, okay? Saying it just says up there, if I sow uh, bountifully, uh, plentifully, then I will reap plentifully. Well, it's what are you going to do with the reaping? Everybody follow me on that? And God is very particular about that along the way. So summary, uh, in the Old Testament talks about first fruits. Uh, Corinthians <clears throat> talks about the first day of the week, uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. Uh, Ephesians 4, give generously to others. Uh, God gives us uh, so that we can help others. We'll see that illustration in a moment. Uh, and so generously, get generously. That is a biblical message. That is not health, wealth, prosperity. God will bless us. But I think, as I said last week, uh, if he can trust us, Okay. We say, well, I'm, I'm afraid to give because, you know, I may need it in the future. It's a fear thing. It's a trust issue with God. But there's another side to the coin, and it is this. Uh, can God trust us with more? Everybody get that? Yep. Like you, you trust your kids, you give them something, and they go and they abuse it. What do you do the next time? <laughs> you know, uh, the lesson needs to be learned here along the way. Okay, uh, this goes back to lesson one. Our generosity is an expression of the character of God. That's why he wants us to be generous upon every occasion. That's why he wants us to share with those in need. That's why he wants to scatter our gifts among the poor. I mean, it just it's redundant throughout Scripture, uh, God's posture on that. That he will give us abundance if we are willing to share it with others along the way. Now, Luke, again, says, uh, Give it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, uh, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. There is a relationship between uh, our generosity. And if you, if you see in that verse, it says, the more you're generous, the more I'll give to you to be generous. Does that make sense? You know? I mean, it's like with your kids. You know, the first time they take the car, they wreck it. You know, <laughs> No, but if they have a history of being a good driver and careful, you go, well, sure, you can take it any time. It's a thing that we live out in families and other relationships, employee, employer relationships and so forth along the way. And then this one is the countercultural. God's generosity to us is intended to raise our standard of giving, not our standard of living. That's a hurt. <laughs> That's a hurt. Now, I did do a book report on this book that I gave you last week. Uh, in, to the teaching staff of the training center. So we had from Robert Cup to whoever. <laughs> okay, we're sitting in there. And two illustrations that come out of this book, if you haven't read it yet, if you come to gray pages, there's stories about people. And the one was Tom Monahan. Anybody recognize that name? Owner of Domino Pizza. At the peak of his career, he sold, he was selling through his Domino outlets 54% of all pizzas in the United States. It may have been delivered, but, but he was at the top of his career. And then he read Mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis. And he discovered, and this goes back to another one of the four, uh, the four true riches. He said, I am the most proud man in America. Not only do I want to sell the most pizzas, I want to sell more than anybody else. <laughs> he said, just so I can say I did it. That's pride. He sold the company. And he is now in the process. I think he's still living. He is in the process of using all of his money to get more people into heaven. Wow. <laughs> okay, he, he got this. The second one was a story, and you may have heard, have any of you heard the phrase, work like a doctor, live like a nurse? <clears throat> Renee Locke was a OBGYN, 40 years of age, met all her financial goals, you know, good career, everything going well. And then she went on a, a short-term mission trip to a third world country and saw how other people lived. She's out jogging. You can see it on video and generous giving and some other places. But she was out jogging and then she said, that's where I talked to God. And God said to Renee Locke, an OBGYN, good income, you know, having the stuff, said to Renee Locke, I want you to work like a doctor and live like a nurse. Really? 
You mean I have to keep a budget now? <laughs> that was one of her issues. She never had to think about, you know, do I, can I do it? No, I just do it. I got money. She started working for one fourth of what she was, or she was working and got paid as a doctor, but a nurse's average income was one fourth of hers. And she started putting three fourths away into uh, giving and blessing and overseas and so forth. Everybody kind of get in the picture? It's not apart from this right here. Do you see the continuity? It's a choice. It's a choice. But there are people who discover that. And I, I could read, well, you can read for yourself out of here, Renee Lockie's words of the joy she has now. And she said, the big hole that I had in my life three or four years ago, though she was successful and had everything she wanted, she said, that hole is gone now. God's generosity is meant to be shared with others in need, and it's a principle of the... Uh, the uh, strong helping the weak. Another story, <clears throat> some of you will recognize Willow Creek Church in Chicago is a noted church. and uh, Their pastor wrote a book called Simplify. And in there he tells about uh, his habit was to go to a certain coffee shop uh, most mornings and do his study there. To me, that drive me crazy, <laughs> but that's the way he did it. And, uh, and he had a regular uh, waitress who usually brought him and refilled his coffee, co coffee cup because he'd stay there for you know a couple hours or something. And so on this particular day, he was going to uh, give her a tip for $20, a very generous tip. And God said to him, no, give her a $100 tip for a cup of coffee. <laughs> well, uh, okay, God. So he reached in, he had $100, which, you know, if God said that to me, I never have $100 in my pocket. <laughs> uh, so reached in and put it, slipped it under uh, the napkin, whatever, and left. Comes back to, you know, whatever next day, and uh, same waitress is there, uh, doesn't say a thing to him. Gives him his coffee, serves him. But when it came time to bring the bill, she brought the bill and a little envelope under it. And so he got out in the car and uh, opened it up. Uh, it's a very touching story, by the way. He opened it up, and here's what it said. Uh, you don't know what it meant to me last week, or whatever it was, uh, when you gave that to me. Well, he had, Bill had seen, Bill Heibel had seen her go over to the phone in the corner, uh, answer her phone, tears in her eyes, get herself back together, and she went back to serving. And uh, she said, the phone call I took last week while you were here, whatever day it was, uh, was for my husband. And he said, I'm leaving, I emptied the bank account, I took our only car, good luck. She said, then you gave me $100. So... Again, sharing with others in need, being open to that, and more stories that I could tell. Now, question, is it the thought that counts? What's today? Happy Father's, <laughs> in case nobody told you that. Happy Father's Day. Now, I, we have a boy and a girl, I think I've said that before. What if, uh, you know, on Wednesday I get a, get a note saying, I was thinking of you on Sunday. <laughs> Is it the thought that counts? We say, it's the thought that counts. No, it's the action that counts. Okay, It's no different with God, and I'll give you a verse for it. But this from <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. No one would remember the Good Samaritan if he only had good intentions. He had money as well. He could do something. Okay, This is what James says. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied, uh, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Okay? So it is not the thought that counts, and it is not the thought that counts when, boy, I wish I could give to fellowship, but, you know, we had a, we spent it all on vacation and the next two months income. <laughs> okay? It's not the thought that counts, it is action that counts of being a good steward. And it's the principle of the strong helping the weak. <clears throat> so God blesses us. Uh, you know, he enlarges our store of seed and goodness so that we can help those who are weak around us. Now, Paul says, our desire is not that others might be uh, relieved while you are hard-pressed, 
but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. And if we go back to Acts chapter 2, some of you will recognize that passage. It's where the early believers, it says they had nothing in need because they shared with each other. They went and they sold parcels of land because somebody, you know, who would become a Christian in the Jewish culture would lose their job, maybe their family or whatever. They go, hey, we can help. We can help. And I want to go back to that Ephesians 4.28. It says, stop stealing and that may mean more than just coming over to your house and taking your lawnmower. <laughs> it may mean, and I think it does, stealing from somebody that God gave you that extra to meet their need. Everybody follow me on that? Okay. There's more in that verse than just what uh, you know comes off at the first reading. Okay, here we go. Enjoy while I drink my tea. Out of the blue and ask you to do something sort of random. Well, that's exactly how I felt on Sunday when I was asked to pick up a card with a name on it for a past appreciation gift. God just showed up and told me he wanted to do something special for this guy, and somehow I would be involved. I didn't know what it was, but I knew it had to be something more than the $25 gift card I was thinking about. At that moment, I knew I was about to be pushed outside of my comfort zone. Boy, I had no idea. Two days later, I had this doctor appointment, and my wife was with me. It ended early, and since we are rarely without any of our five kids, I said, hey, let's have some lunch together. We were still new to the area, so after lunch, we decided to shop some, and then head back to the car. As we turned around, there he was, this guy with his wife, the one who God had just told me days before that he wanted to do something for. And I'm thinking, I really don't know these people, but I know that God said something special was going to happen. So we talked about stuff at church where we had just heard Dave Ramsey speak. They talked about how they had been working for nine years to get out of their debt, but that they had $10,000 more to go, and it felt like this huge rock in their life. He said, as soon as we're out of debt, we want to adopt. But we promised our kids that they could have a trampoline first, and then we would adopt. So we said our goodbyes, and I was thinking, thank you, God. I get it. I know exactly what you want me to do. We got in the car, and I was so excited. I said to my husband, I know what we need to do. Let's go buy them a trampoline. Uh, well, uh, why don't we just give them $10,000? What? Are you serious? Honey, we can't just give people money like that. Money changes things and does weird stuff to people. Why can't we give them money? People have done that for me and it was okay. Besides, we have it. Listen, all I know is that when I heard them speak, I heard God say in a very clear way, take away their debt. I had to think about it for a second. Giving away $10,000 had never crossed my mind. I really wrestled wondering what God wanted us to do. Here I am with five children. It wasn't like there was a lot of extra money sitting around. And my husband worked so hard for our family. But God revealed to me that though I had plans to make home improvements and invest in this literal earth, he wanted me to make an eternal investment for his kingdom. I knew then what we had to do and began to get anxious to follow God's call. So we called him up and said, hey, we want to come and talk to you about something. We promise it will only take a minute. When we drove up, though, we could tell they weren't sure about what to think of us. Are we going to sell them something or what? So I just kind of blurted out, Lamp, Amy, we don't really know how to say this, but we just want to give you $10,000. We told them that there are no strings attached, that God just wanted to bless them. Oh, and we also told them, don't act weird around us around church and don't tell anyone it was us. As I stood there, I'm thinking, wow, what a tremendous thrill and total joy, not just to be giving someone money, but to play a part and be included in the secret plans of the God of this universe. The giving part of the story was fun, but that was just the beginning. In less than a year, God led Lance and Amy to adopt a beautiful baby girl named Leah. And because God wove Lance and Amy's life into ours, 
we welcomed our ninth child, Olivia Grace, born April 21st, 2008, into our family. But this story, this just keeps getting better. And to think, I was thinking of a $25 gift card. So what are your thoughts? What do you think about that? I know, it's good. <laughs> what? Uh, so, to kind of lead you into a couple of responses, uh, what was necessary for them to do that? Heart. Heart. They had a heart that wanted to follow God. Good, Jerry. Okay. What else? Know their need. Pardon? Know their need. The, know the need. Yeah, know it. information about the need. That's good. Okay. Resources. They had to live by margin, living below their means. You know, again, a lot of us might be, oh, it's the thought that counts. I'd really love to help them. <laughs> you know, I'm already overdrawn. You know, I'm on minimum payments on my credit cards and so forth. They had to be living by margin. That's planning ahead. God will bless us and let us be a blessing to others. And does it fall in this category? Mm -hmm. Oh, he said it just gets, or she said it just gets, it gets better and better. It's getting better and better. It is a joy to be generous. That's why you'll see up on a slide probably every week, pursuing the joy of generosity. Generosity is not an obligation. It's not a guilt thing. It's a journey, and it should be a thrilling journey, not one out of duty along the way. Okay, so um, one a verse that's written in James, uh, you say, well, I asked God for something, but he didn't give it to me. James has an answer. When you ask <laughs> and you do not receive, <laughs> don't kill the messenger, I'm just reading the book. Okay. Uh, when you ask uh, and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you got on your pleasures, on your, on your pleasures, yeah, on your pleasures, okay? So it goes right back up here, right? You want to consume it or you want to bless somebody with it? And I know it's countercultural, and I know, uh, anyway, it's what the, what the Word of God says. Uh, let's talk about giving out much. Somebody was going to take this class and she said to me, are you going to talk about tithing? I go, well, yeah, why? Well, my mother said, if, you know, if you don't tithe, you're going to, I don't know she said, go to H or not, but, but you, you're not going to end up in a good place. I said, well, we're going to talk about that. So let's talk about tithing. Okay, the tithe is a starting point for giving, not the finish line. That may be the first time you ever heard of that. Because most of the preaching that you've ever heard, and I listened to a lot of preachers and done a lot of preaching, and I didn't get that picture until 2005. Uh, I, okay, I'm supposed to tie to the church, but do we all know what the actual giving uh, giving percentage is for people like us, Bible believing, going to Bible teaching churches? You know what it is? It's like 2%. 2.3%. 2.3 or 2.5. So we don't even believe that uh, by our practice. That's how we know if we believe it or not. Uh, but you normally we heard you give 10% and then uh, you can do whatever with the rest. Okay. Now there's two things, two reasons we like that. One, let me do the check off for God and then leave me alone with the rest, okay? Which is not <laughs> biblical. And the second is, we like the freedom to consume. Uh, but again, there's another message as I talked about. Now, here's what the goal is, uh, and I'm going to try to make the case for it being a biblical posture giving what is acceptable to God from your circumstances, ability, life stage, desire, etc., choices. And I want you to pull out this sheet because we're going to work our way through the principles that are found in, in acceptable giving. And again, you get, you're going to get the book today that fills it out, but I'll give you the cliff notes on it uh, here today. Uh, acceptable giving, by the way, is a <clears throat> phrase which you will find as early in the Bible as Genesis 3 or 4, forget which, where you have offerings from Cain and Abel. Remember that story? The two boys. Two boys in the back. <laughs> Nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay? With good names. Good Bible names. Uh, 
But one, it says, was an acceptable gift, and one was a not acceptable gift. And it led to very bad results of murder and so forth. That's how early you find it. You'll find the term acceptable giving throughout the Levitical instructions of Exodus Leviticus, where it says, bring a gift that is acceptable to God. I don't want a dove with a broken wing. I don't want a sick lamb. I don't want some uh, polluted offering that you don't really want anyhow, and you bring it as a gift to me. No, that is not acceptable along the way. But here's the amazing thing. It's found multiple times in the New Testament. But I can just about guarantee it. Well, before I was enlightened, awakened, uh, I never talked about that. And, you know, preached for 43 years. But just was, we just never taught it. Acceptable giving. Uh, where Paul says this, your gift is acceptable, one of the places, not according what, to what you do not have. And that's important. Now, remember I said it would have been unfair for God to come to Ray and I and say, can you give some land for the Fayetteville Church or the Bentonville Church? I don't have land in the area, okay? God, your giving is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you do not have, okay? I can't give a gift like Warren Buffett gave to Bill Gates, $36.2 billion. No, I don't have that assets. You know, take off, take off everything. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, none of us are even there, probably. Is what is acceptable. So what does that mean, uh, giving that is acceptable? Let me see what's up here. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get it on the screen. One, the amount matters. Here's what's tied up in the word matters. And uh, you'll read about it in the book. Does it, if you have a mortgage, does it matter if you make your mortgage payment this month? Yes. <laughs> yeah, because somebody's going to be camping on your doorstep or your credit card payment. Or your license tags on your car. Does it matter? Okay, does it matter to us our giving to God? Or is it a throwaway? Is it a side? If I have something left over, it matters. David was going to make an offering, and there was a guy named Aruna who said, Hey, I'm on your side. I'll give you the wood. I'll give you the cow. And David said, No, I will not offer my God gifts that cost me nothing. Right? And uh, that is it. That is a. Uh, an issue in our giving, as we'll come to see. I'm going to skip the engagement ring. You can read about the Cracker Jack, <laughs> cracker jack box thing. Uh, it's often a planned trans transaction. Uh, the book that we'll give you out next week, give you next week, talks about uh, priority giving. That means you set aside, John, before you spend it. This is what it's got along the way. Uh, it is it a planned transaction. And by the way, Steve, and you know this, the giving uh, at Fellowship during the COVID thing was incredible because much of it was already an EFT, a bank, you know, transaction. Just every month do this, every two weeks do it, do it. And that kept the offerings in a good spot. And it went higher. The EFTs and the, and the electronic, people found a way. Yeah, yeah. People found, they, they found a way to give. It's a heart, it was all about the heart of it. Yeah, and, and some of it, we're dropping it in here. Well, I can't do that, you know, for however many weeks. Oh, I can go to my bank and just let them do it along the way or my credit card or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and the last one of the first, uh, first point here, it has an impact on your spending plan. It does make a difference on what's available for the rest of your spending. And living in the abundant culture that we're in, many of us, including Ray and I, uh, this is sobering to me. There are things we do without, but are they critical things? You know, I don't go without any meals. <laughs> you know, I don't go without a car to drive. You know, does it really affect my spending plan? Uh, secondly, we determine the amount. You saw that in the passage we read out of Corinthians. Each one should determine how much you give. Okay, uh, God gives us a lot of res a lot of uh, uh, flexibility. In that he gives us responsibility, but he says, "I want you to decide." I don't. I don't even. Oh, we can mess. I was going to say we don't even say ten percent, uh, because uh, acceptable giving is a different platform. Uh, we have a responsibility to give. There are two thousand verses uh, in the Bible that talk about it. Uh, I think I mentioned before that if we talked about giving as much at fellowship from the platform, Steve, and, I, and I'm not up there, as Jesus did, every fourth sermon would be on money and giving. Now, that's an amazing statistic. That's how important God thought it was, and it was going to be a problem for us, and that goes to the verse about you can't worship God and mammon. You can't do both. You're going to be on one side or the other. 
Uh, we've read the verse about given will be given to you. Uh, we have the freedom to choose a standard. Uh, here's the 2% rule of giving. It's already, how much do Christians in America give? About 2% and change. But there's another 2%. There are 2,000 or 2,500 verses in the Bible that talk about uh, giving. 2% of them talk about tithing. There are about 40 verses on tithing. And in case you haven't heard this before, tithing in the Bible is only, in the New Testament, is only mentioned in a negative state. Christ said to the Pharisees, you tithe your mint and your cumin, but you do not take care of justice and mercy. That was not a recommendation to tithe. <laughs> That was a condemnation because of abuse of tithing, thinking you take care of the littlest down to the littlest thing and you think you're good. No, your heart is wrong. Your heart is wrong. Okay. Uh, Paul never mentions tithing, by the way, in all the instruction books uh, that we have at uh, the New Testament disciples. Uh, Paul never talks about it. I know you're looking at me like, what? <laughs> I'm breaking a glass ceiling today. Okay. But it's God's word. In the Old Testament, there were eight kinds of gifts in the Old Testament. Four were decided by the giver uh, that determined that God gives us a lot of freedom in our giving. Uh, but what we're seeking is what is the acceptable gift. Uh, the, la uh, the third one, we give according to our abilities. Second uh, Corinthians 8, acceptable according to what, he ha what we have. He breaks it down into three interesting, uh, interesting categories here. Profitability, that's basically our income. You may want to write these words out to the side. Possession ability is our assets. Okay, that is savings, investment, inheritance. And then the last one is providential ability. That is, did God bless you with an inheritance? Did God bless you with a spiritual legacy, job, health, and so forth? And you may want to give uh, just a joy gift to God for that along the way. By the way, in the church, we normally just ask for, uh, for offerings from the profitability from the income, proportionally, weekly, systematically, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we rarely ask for money from assets. That's a different category of giving. It often happens like in the, in the Benville campaign, you know, there's an opportunity to give extra and so forth. And a lot of people will be giving not out of their income, but out of assets. But seldom do we get, uh, ask for assets. And where we really don't ask is in the third category, which he, which is the normal three, three, is legacy giving. And that's why in session six of this course, we're going to talk about inviting God into your estate plan uh, because uh, the, the church has not done a good job of that along the way. The last one, the heart makes the gift count. And that's where uh, somebody, uh, Jesus is talking about bringing your gifts to the altar while you're on the outs with somebody else. He said, don't bother. You know, just leave your gift there because your heart is not right. Go make it up with that other person and then come back and all, uh, your gift will be acceptable. Uh, anyway, that's it's sobering to think about along the way. Now, on the practical level, and I'll try to save two or three minutes at the end to, uh, to ask for questions. Because I've given you a lot of stuff, but we're also going to give you a book. And we can, if we don't get it done today, we'll start out next time with some questions on the giving part. Uh, giving to where and what, there are two different ways to give, uh, essentially, by geography. Uh, that comes out of Acts 1-8, where Paul says, uh, or where Luke says, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the world. There's a four-part giving pattern there. Uh, Jerusalem. Uh, catch up with me here. Okay. Uh, Jerusalem is our city or local ministry, giving to the local church. And do you have those verses in your book? I can't see here or not. Are they in there? Yeah. I'm not going to take the time to read them, but they basically say the people who lead in the church and teach should be supported by the church. Everybody got that? That's a condensation of the, of, the, of the verses along the way. Clear in Scripture. There are churches who have no paid pastors. Anybody know the Plymouth Brethren Group? Anybody history in that? Yeah. 
they do not believe in paid pastors, but scripturally, uh, it's good to support so that we have paid staff here, and that's the practice that we do. Yep. Those who are taught the word, those who are taught the word of God should provide. It is up to the people who go to the church. Provide for your teaching, sharing all good things with them. Other local ministries. So you move out a circle from local to kind of state or region. Judea, that was kind of like their state in compared to their city of Jerusalem. Samaria, that's moving out to what I've labeled national ministries. And then the last one is what we would call uh, world missions, global outreach, cross-cultural ministry. It is going to the ends of the earth. And all of that is in Acts 1-8. Okay, there's a pattern for giving. Ray and I follow that pattern, and here's why. Because in Revelation it says that one day when we're standing with Christ and, the whole, and all of the people who become Christ followers, God followers, will be out there, there will be some from where? Every tribe, nation, language, people group. We want to invest with diversification so that there will be people from Nigeria and people from South America and people from North America and whatever. You can, you can invest geographically, but there is another way to do that. You can invest in uh, the kingdom, third category, uh, by uh, function. Uh, and this comes out of the Great Commission. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the, <clears throat> in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So we pick up these things out of that common, uh, very familiar and common verse. Evangelism, go and make disciples. Discipleship is in there. Church planting, that's what happened through the New Testament story. Leadership uh, training, development, Bible translation. Teach them all that I've commanded you, only if they get a copy, maybe, or hear it in their heart language. Community development and compassion. So what, um, what has God given you a burden for? Okay, one of the burdens that Ray and I have is for, if you've been in, <laughs> been in missiology conversations all do you know the 1040 world do you know what i mean when i say that 1040 world is that strip that's across north africa and into the middle east and wraps around to southeast asia okay that's the 1040 world largely muslim and so we invest heavily in muslim ministries the most unreached people the largest people group in the world uh, other than christianity and i could talk more about it uh, easily I was driving over to this class, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, and God brought to my mind, uh, I don't know that I ever read it anywhere, discounts to our giving, which is sobering. How can we give and get it discounted? And we'll go through it pretty quickly. One, giving for recognition or ostentation, to get a name on a building. And in Christian higher education, that is Christian colleges and universities, there's a whole discussion about this. Uh, if I want to give $8 million for a new gym or a science building, or whatever, do I get my name on the corner of the building? Well, you might, but I think if you, if you look into this first, you're probably going to get a discount for credit. <laughs> if, you know, the, God is keeping a credit a lot going. Yeah, there's a little humor in there, Paul. <laughs> uh, obligation, uh, if I have to. Okay, the easiest money to raise in a church is during the summer when the air conditioning goes out. Everybody got that? <laughs> it's called obligation. I don't, you may not get discounted. Grudgingly, we like to cheerfully verse. Giving cheerfully. It is thrilling to give, to help people, extend the kingdom, help people in need. It should be a joy of generosity, not a burden. Or give without love. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, if I give even my body to be burned, that's kind of the big, <laughs> big thing to give, right? You just did it all and do it without love. It says it is worth nothing. That's a total discount, 100% discount uh, with bad heart. Oh, and one more, broken relationships, that's what we talked about. Leave your gift at the altar. Go make right with the brother or the sister. Then come back and it'll be an acceptable gift along the way. Final words, give strategically would be my counsel. Uh, that is thoughtfully. Where's God's passion? You start with a local church. You move out a circle, out a circle, out a circle. Do it that way. Or what is my passion? Evangelism, discipleship, etc. along the way. Things that we've looked, about, looked at. And I say again, always include giving to the poor. You can give to your church faithfully and you say, well, okay, did, Steve, does some money go to Samaritan House through our regular offering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can say that's it. 
But I'll tell you, if you start giving directly to the poor, there's a blessing there that's uh, better. <laughs> Let me just say, you know, when you find somebody in need and you help them directly and you see the joy on their face, uh, giving arm's length is okay. But I would encourage uh, get involved, get engaged with it. This is the good housekeeping seal of approval, if we're old enough to remember <laughs> that in this, in this uh, conversation. But ECFA, Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, it is a voluntary group that people join with. And here's what they say. Uh, we do not give excessive salaries. This is all talking about in the Christian context, okay? Uh, we do not give excessive salaries to our top execs. Our books are open for you to come and look at it any time. And we are an organization of integrity. If you go to the fellowship website, you're going to find the ECFA. My counsel is do not give to something if they do not have the ECFA. I used to say that just total, but I was challenged, corrected. Unless you personally know the person involved in that organization, what they're doing. There, there can be an exception, but I still say ask the ordinate organization why they are not a part of ECFA. Uh, what are... Why don't you say my books are open and we're not, you know, doing bad things with money? Okay, savings in a minute or two. It's a biblical principle. The wise have wealth and luxury, but the fools spend whatever they get. And again, that's a, a damning uh, statement about our culture. Um, God said it, okay? Here are the categories, short-term savings, emergency fund, cash buying reserve, a thousand dollars better to have three months living expenses Dave Ramsey talks about a lot about these uh, principles here many people are always in debt because they have no emergency fund and that's why he says that it's good counsel but it comes right out of the Bible have an emergency fund so if the tires go out or your free refrigerator quits or the air conditioning goes out you don't have to pull out the credit card You'll be amazing the kind of freedom that that will give you uh, just moving to that first step. Long-term saving for major purchases, retirement, long-term health care, all things that uh, we can talk about down the road. A responsibility to your family when you start working and earning an income. Okay? You have family. You should be doing this just out of respect for your family. Uh, Paul says this interesting thing. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. <laughs> okay? And, but I can tell you two stories of pastor friends of mine who are right on the other side of that. You know, they're dependent on their kids, you know? Wow. Okay. I think we did it. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the rush. I hope there was some, you know, picking the fruit off as we go along and things that are helpful. So, question or two before we go, and if there are questions during the week, I really appreciate it, by the way. Well, I appreciate all of you who are watching live stream, uh, and we feel like you're with us, so we can't see you. I hope you heard the video and all of that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Oh, there is something that was supposed to happen today, but it's a good for both, both uh, audiences. When we get to week six, and we're going to talk about this uh, uh, no out-of-pocket cost for a free will and a free trust. Everybody got that? That's what we're heading for. That's going to take place with an email that's correct. I kind of said that to you, and somehow I didn't get the, the sheet here today. And that's going to be important for those of you who are out there listening as well, because we need to have a correct email address or you will not get into the process along the way. Uh, and that's rules with the organization that we are just and just signed a contract with this last week so that we can make that available through fellowship and Steve thank you and the elders and the leadership here uh, for wanting to serve our congregation that way we'll get that sheet out next week there'll be time on that we have one more week then it's July 4th two weeks from today no meeting we come back on the 11th we do the 18th wind up and uh, then we'll be through with this class any question before we leave? Or yes, John again. So in the, in the bucket of giving to the poor, do you have any practical ways to involve Giving to the poor? Involving kids. What did you say, Paul? Involving kids. Involving kids. Involving kids. Involving kids. Involving kids. Okay, yeah, thanks. Well, there's Samaritan, but I didn't have to make any practical ways. Yeah. There are organizations... Uh, that are that specialized in that, like Compassion International, 
uh, would be one where you could like adopt a kid. And there, there's there been that opportunity here at Fellowship. I remember a couple years ago, there was a board out there in the lobby with pictures of kids. So that would be, that would be one way to do it. Uh, I was involved with short-term teams in uh, Haiti for five years. And we helped build a couple, a boys' home and a girls' home, and then supported kids down there, my wife and I. So we were involved with them. Going back to that personal involvement, I would really recommend that. Uh, but others of you... Community Kids Closet. Okay, Community Kids Closet. Okay, they're local, and it stretches out to the ends of the world. You know, there's always an opportunity. Uh, and does that help at least start the conversation? Yeah, we can talk more about it. Speaking huh? America. Feeding America. Feeding America, yeah. Mercy ships. Mercy ship. Mercy ship. That's uh, comes out of uh, Operation Mobilization. Uh, go around the world on a number of ships. I don't know how many they have now. My sister served in that for a while, uh, and they will pull into a port and they'll do medical and dental and reading and evangelism and so forth. There, there's an abundance of places to do, but I would recommend doing it so there's some personal connection with it because you will be blessed by that. Not a Jewish thing. Not a Jewish voice. Jewish? Yeah. Would you say? That's a lot of Jewish things. Things we can do. Okay, I can't hear. Yeah, I know. I'm just talking about a lot of the Jewish needs for the yeah. Jewish people. Yes. Uh, Russia and Czechoslovakia and different places. Yeah, if you are not familiar with the name Joel Rosenberg, uh, my wife and I have uh, recently started investing in his Joshua Fund, which is given to help the needy in Jerusalem, both Arab and Jew. If some of you read the Joel Rosenberg books, The Persian Gamble, <laughs> you know, they're thrilling novels, bestsellers, so forth. Joel Rosenberg, uh, who is a born again Jew, lives currently in Israel, but lived in America for a while as well. Joel Rosenberg. There, there are lots of them around. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, good question, John. Yeah, see? I just real quick from Fellowship. We're a big organization, obviously, and about EFCA. We do an independent audit every year. Yeah. Like independent auditor, and it, it's always super boring. Which, which you want. I, <laughs> but help me, is that, a, is that a requirement of ECFA or just voluntary. Do you know? It was being done voluntarily before we even went to I know, but does the ECFA require that to be a member? I don't know that. I believe it does. I think so, but I'm not sure. You're doing an audit. In other words, you're not... Well, I could tell stories of organizations. One, Christian College lost $18 million. They didn't know where it was for years. Then they did an audit and found it. It was not there. And it wasn't... It wasn't... Uh, what do I mean? Uh, yeah, it wasn't fraud. It was just bad bookkeeping. They had thought they had that asset, and it was gone. It never was there. I don't know what it was. So. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Okay, five minutes of overtime. I can say we started four minutes late. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the class. I'm enjoying teaching you. Have a great week. Enjoy the cool, and uh, see you back next uh, Sunday for week four. Thanks for being here. Uh, pick up your stuff on the way out, a book and uh, pages.